Hello everyone, welcome to Gillen High School's first official licensed TEDx youth event. TEDx Gillen High School. I'm Anish Mupadi. And I'm Eden Doyle, and we are the founders of TEDx Gilderland. TEDx Gilderland is a mission to help Gilderland High School students achieve their goal of expressing their ideas, stories, and experiences. We really, we really hope to inspire others with this program. But before we start our, uh, our event, we'd like to acknowledge a few key people who helped us get us here. Firstly, we'd like to thank Dr. Singleton. He's been here since the birth of the idea, from getting our license accepted, supervising the entire program, helping get the stage built, and overall just being there to support us. Secondly, we'd like to thank Mr. Maycock and his media team for helping us with this design, the lights, audio, and pretty much everything you see here. And we'd also like to thank Quincy Brown for photography. And lastly, we'd like to thank our speakers. They've been working really hard this past month, and they've been dedicated to help deliver their talk to you. Now please welcome Charles Joseph with Money Moves. The average life expectancy for a person in the U.S. is 80 years. From ages 4 to 24, you'll be getting your education. You'll be going to school, you'll be going to college, you'll be getting your diploma or degree, and then you'll find a job that will suit you. But from ages 25 to 65, you will be working. You'll be working a 9 to 5 job each and every day. This visual that I've created shows you how much of your life you'll be spent working, which is roughly half of your life. Now, what if there was a way to eliminate this financial burden of working? What if there was a way that you can live life to the fullest and travel around the world and do whatever your heart desires? Now, the equation is simple, ladies and gents. All you have to do is that you have to invest in assets. You don't have to be the next Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg. You don't have to be a computer genius. You don't have to invent something new. All you have to do is invest in income-producing assets. Now, in this capitalistic environment that we live in, it is crucial, it is essential to be financially educated. Now, in today's day and age, financial education is not something that people come by. We have classes here at the high school, such as personal finance and entrepreneurship. But these classes are not mandatory, and they're often overlooked by students. So kids will end up going to college, graduating, and they'll be drowning in college debt. They have a lot of expenses to pay. They won't be able to pay taxes on time. And more importantly, they won't be able to find loopholes in the tax system, like our president. <laughs> but at this rate, achieving financial freedom is impossible. Financial freedom can be characterized as quitting your job and living off of passive income. You can live without having to worry about money. Now, passive income. Passive income is money that comes to you, money that you don't have to work for. And in achieving financial freedom, you will enjoy the many splendors of life. Now, after years of watching YouTube videos, podcasts, reading books about finance, I've developed a few basic and core principles to ensure financial success in the future. If you follow these core principles with hard work and diligence, and if you're willing to put it all in, then I can assure you financial freedom and financial success will come to you. Principle number one, you have to invest in yourself. Investing in yourself is very important. Now, you can start off investing in yourself by, you know, reading books, watching YouTube videos. You can do all of these things to invest in yourself in order to become financially educated. Some books I would recommend is Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad, 
or Benjamin Graham's The Intelligent Investor. Books like these and watching podcasts can surely ensure financial independence in the future. Now, a major misunderstanding that people have is the difference between liabilities and assets. Assets are things that take money, assets are things that put money into your pocket. Liabilities take money out of your pocket. Common liabilities include your car, because as soon as your car rolls all of, off of the dealership, it immediately depreciates by 20%. Or your house, contrary to what many real estate agents may tell you, or what your banker may tell you, your house is not an asset, it is a liability. You have to pay for mortgage, you have to pay each and every month for utilities and maintenance. Principle number two, make your money work for you. Don't work for your money. If you are waking up each and every day and going to a nine to five job, you are, you are working for your money. You have to chase your money. In the case of an emergency, where you cannot work anymore, and you have to pay for your emergency, you won't be able to fully support yourself because you will no longer be able to chase your money. And this is what the rich and wealthy call the rat race. You have to chase your money just as how a rat would have to chase its food. But how would you get out of the rat race to ensure financial independence? Well, what you have to do is that you have to make your money work for you. And to do that, you have to invest. You have to invest in assets that will make you money. So in theory, your money will be making for you. Because each and every month or every year, you'll be getting some checks or cash which will make you more money. Now a great way to start off is to invest in the stock market. Now the stock market is pretty risky and volatile, but with proper education, and if you can predict when the markets will go up and down, the stock market is a great way to make money. For example, a prime, for example Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett has been investing for the last 78 years. And during this time, he has acquired a net worth of $83 billion. Another great way to invest your money is to invest in real estate. Now, real estate is a bit more expensive than the stock market, but it's also more stable. The next, the next principle is discipline. You have to be disciplined. If you want to ensure financial success, you can't throw your money out. You, you can't throw your money on unnecessary and useless pleasures and luxuries. Instead, what you have to do is that you have to be able to budget and save. The common trend for most people is that the more money they make, the higher their expenses are. Now, although this is true, this is not ideal in ensuring financial success. Instead, what you should be doing is that regardless of how much money you make, your expenses should always stay the same. And the difference between your expenses and the amount of money you make is what you can invest. And in doing that, you can ensure financial success. Next principle, save to invest. Don't save for the sake of saving. If you are saving for the sake of saving, you're not gonna get anything. Many people, they just throw their money in the bank and they just allow it to sit there. This isn't gonna result to very much because a good bank account will only have interest rates of two to 5%, which is marginal compared to what you could actually be making. If you invest your money in stocks or real estate or et cetera, such as bonds, you can exponentially increase your wealth because money grows exponentially. If you're going through your average nine to five job, you are working for some time and you'll get raises here and there. But overall, your financial model will be linear. You, you will be making money in a straight line. Whereas if you invest your money, you can grow it exponentially. For example, real estate. If you buy a rental property and you collect rent each and every month, and you use that rent to buy another property, you have doubled the amount of money you, you can make in real estate and in your portfolio. And if you repeat this over and over again, you can triple and quadruple your wealth and net worth. And this is what the core investors understand, that money does not grow linearly, it grows exponentially. 
the more you invest, the more money you will make. Also, in this day and age, it is more important to invest than ever. Because automation is taking over many industries. For example, garbage men. When I was younger, I used to see garbage men every week picking up the garbage and disposing of it. But today, I don't see that anymore. All I see are robotic arms picking up garbage and disposing of it. This is automation in their career and their field. And this is going to come in the future to even more careers and even more fields. So in order to prevent this from happening to you, or to ensure your luxury and comfort in the future, you should invest. So if that ever does happen to you, you will be safe. Next principle, and one of the most important ones. Start early, and I cannot stress this enough. The earlier you start, the more money you will make in the future. And this graph right here shows that starting early does result in more money. Many people in their early 20s and 30s, they don't give much thought to finance. And in doing this, when they're in their 40s and 50s, they're not going to have enough money for their future, nor are they going to have enough money for retirement. I've already started investing. A group of friends and I, we have come together and we have started investing in some stocks. Now, as of right now, we're not doing too well. But that's okay, and my friends are not happy as well either, because they each lost about 20 cents, and they blame it on me. <laughs> but that's okay, because we are learning, and we are learning about the markets. We are reading the news each and every day. We are looking to see where money can be made, and essentially, we are taking our first steps to financial freedom. And finally, money management and sacrifices are essential. Living frugally early on can result to a luxurious life in the future. Maybe you may not be able to afford to buy a brand new house as of right now, but if you cut back on that $5 mocha frappuccino and other things, I can assure you that in the future, you will have more than enough money to buy any type of macro frappuccino you want or any house. Money management and finance is important. And if you can invest, execute, and succeed, then I assure you can have a financially safe future. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk. Our next speaker will be taking a peep at the future. Uh, everyone, please welcome Jun Ho Oh with his talk, Your Pocket's Potential. Fifteen years from today, it would not have been the safest bet to say that all of you sitting in this room right now have a smartphone in your pocket. Now, when we think of the word smart, the first thing that comes to mind is someone who is mentally admirable. And this could be your teacher, your peer, your supervisor, it could be anyone. But since when did we start pairing this word smart with technology? smart TVs, smart watches, or smartphones. What makes these things so smart? Are they not just ordinarily functioning devices with maybe a wireless capability? Truth is, these devices are a lot smarter than you think. Inside a smartphone, there is a tiny chip called a CPU, or Central Processing Unit. And these are very cool. So the CPU works like a human mind. You give it instructions, it'll carry them out and give you a result. 
And I can almost guarantee that all of you have been given instructions at some point in your life, which you may not have completed properly. But the point is, the CPU is completing all of them flawlessly, and it's receiving billions of them per second. Having a job like that, this thing has earned its respect and title. But why does more than half of our world carry this thing in their pockets to communicate? With 4G, we're able to achieve the quality of life that we have today. But life has not always been this convenient. In order to create 4G, researchers had to develop previous generations of mobile networking technology, starting with 1G. Now, 1G was revolutionary for the field of networking, as it allowed the average consumer to speak across the grid without being tethered to their wall through cords and through wires. Then 2G came along, which allowed digital text messages to be sent over the very signals used for calling. Then 3G rolled along, with multimedia atta attachments to the texts sending from 2G. And right now, we are using 4G with some of the highest signal speeds and highest multimedia capabilities. So the difference between 3G and 4G was multiplying the previous by tenfolds. This meant that if you were to load a web page for 10 seconds on 3G, it would only take one on 4. Now, let's step into the future. So, with a show of hands, how many of you have heard of 5G before? Wow, okay, that's a lot. 5G is the next generation in mobile networking technology. Your current service providers, AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, and Verizon are all currently working to develop this tech into our future. In the past, we have seen multitudes of each generation improving the capabilities of the previous by an exponential amount. Knowing this, we can comprehend that 5G will lead the future with plenty of improvements. So what exactly is the difference between 4G and 5G in terms of hardware? Is this some kind of Android or iOS update we can download and be happy with? And the answer is no. 5G will come with an entirely new set of cell towers, and these are very unique. These cell towers stretch for as, about as tall as a house, and its radius is only 40 meters, but right now, 4G cell towers are hundreds of feet tall, and their range is about 40 miles wide. And you might be thinking that this is a bad thing, but it's actually good. This is due to millimeter wave technology, a completely new area of radio frequency research. So imagine this. You're sitting in a room full of people, much like this one, but by full, I mean there is virtually no space between you and the people sitting next to you. Essentially, 5G is taking a key and opening the door to a nearby room for smoother traffic. But this is not the only improvement coming with 5G. Also, beamforming is being applied. Now, imagine this. You have a light bulb and a flashlight in front of you. When the light bulb is on, it's cascading all of its light around you, and some of it even goes to waste. But the flashlight is concentrating all of its energy on one given point. And this is the difference between 4 and 5G. One is cascading all of its data in radial patterns, and the other is focusing it into one single point. So how fast exactly is 5G? As I mentioned before, your current service providers are all testing these in public areas, and we can take New York City, for example. Testers there were able to get tremendous results, and compared to 4G testers, who got about 60 megabits per second at max all around the country, these testers got up to 2.1 gigabits per second. And this is revolutionary in the field of networking, because this speed is faster than some of the fastest hardwired computers we have today. And if we look in Beijing, China right now, we can see a glimpse of what might be our future. But this not might be a thing. 
So if you were to go to New York City and take the subway, you would need, you would need a pass, a physical one or on your phone. Walk into China, go to a train station, camera picks up your face, connects your information to a database, and you're good to go, or bad to go. So now we can have this glimpse of this fantasized future where download speeds are almost instant, and virtual reality can be publicly live streamed seamlessly from a backpack. So imagine this, a surgeon living in China able to operate on a person living in Oregon. This is the extent of how big 5G will change our world. So take this moment, take this moment to comprehend and consider the amount of power that technology has given us in this given moment. Because before you know it, 2021 will be an entirely different world than we see it right now. So the next time someone asks you, what you think of the word smart. Think again. Thank you. Thank you, Jude. Oh. Our next speaker is Lavanya Prabhakar with Making Sense of the Multi. Imagine that you're a field of roses. Each rose in the field looks exactly the same to the other rose, but they're all uniquely different. Now, imagine that you're in another field of roses. In this field of roses, each rose looks exactly the same, but they're all different from each other. Now, instead of the roses, imagine that you're in a crowd of 100 people, and every person looks the same as you do. Now this brings up the question of existence. What happens if everyone looks the same as you? What if everyone looks and thinks and acts like you do? What will you do? Well, this theory is entirely plausible in an alternate universe. There's, we will be exploring whether it's possible to have multiverses in this universe. There are four main theories regarding universes. The first one talks about infinite universes. Now, there's something called space-time continuum. If you have space-time continuum, it's a fabric that stretches horizontally forever. And it basically controls the amount of particles that can be reproduced. So with our universe, we have a set of particles that keeps reproducing in a cyclical cycle and essentially forms what we have as stars and nebulae and planets. Now imagine the cycle, but it keeps repeating. If it keeps repeating, you'll have another universe and another universe and another universe, and it goes on forever. So now you have an infinite amount of universes. Our second theory, talks about bubble universes. So in this universe, we talk about space-time continuum once again, except in this universe, we mention the fact about the Big Bang. After the Big Bang, the space-time continuum supposedly inflates, which is what happened to our universe, and which is why we live in the world we live in today. Now imagine the space-time continuum, but instead of having just one bubble, there are multiple bubbles. This universe theory talks about the fact that if you have multiple bubbles, are they all related to each other, or are they all different from each other? So, 
For physics, we have a law of laws of physics in our universe which govern how things move, how things act around each other, and how things behave. Now, in multiple bubble universes, these laws of physics don't apply. They all have different rules and sets of laws that govern how motion affects objects in those universes. Now, we will be talking about daughter universes. With daughter universes, this is all about probability and you. Imagine in this universe that you win the lottery. And in this world, you win the lottery and you retire to a foreign island and you're living peacefully. But in an alternate universe, you win the lottery and you go broke. So there's an endless amount of possibilities which could happen. In this universe, you win the lottery. In the next universe, you lose the lottery. In the next one, you win the lottery and you become even more rich and famous. So it talks about the math of probability and basically says that there's a different you in every universe doing the same thing you did, but having an endless number of possibilities to what you did. Now for our fourth and final theory, we have parallel universes. This is the universe which is in all of the books, films, and movies all of you watch. It basically talks about how there's another version of you in every single universe. So in one universe, there's me, and then there's you. In another universe, there's me, and then there's you, but we all behave the same exact way as we do in the first universe. There are multiple copies of us in different universes. This basically plays on the idea of, of the particles repeating themselves in, in a repeated order as they did in our universe. So as we talked about the repetition of particles in the first universe, say in this universe they have the exact same repetition of particles that made up our universe. That means that everyone looks the same as we do in this universe. So now that I'm talking all about universes, what is a universe? So a universe, as we know, is made out of planets, nebulae, gas, uh, stars, among other things. So to create a universe, there are three main steps. The first one being having specific forces. We have electromagnetic force, strong and weak forces, as well as gravitational forces, which all determine how our universe works. The second rule you need to have to create a universe is you need to have a process which separates matter and antimatter. This is essential in creating a universe since it makes sure that there's no chaos surrounding any of the constructions of our planets. Third step in creating a universe is to make sure that there's a balance between antimatter and matter. We need to have more matter than antimatter in order to make nebulae, stars, and planets in order to also support life. So how does the expansion of our current universe play a role in the expansion of other universes and the discovery of other new universes? So, in a quote by Andre Lind, who is a physicist at Stanford University, he says that having a universe, having multi-universes, even though our current universe is expanding, is entirely plausible, since each universe has different regions, and each region has a different law of physics, which is the current theory. Now, if we have an expansion of our current universe, this makes the possibility of having multiverses even more probable because they have different laws of physics in each region. So there's a difference, so there's a chance that we have different multiverses everywhere. So, is there another universe? Personally, I believe that there is another universe. I think given the theories and the facts and the statistics, there, it's entirely possible to have another universe. But I also think there's some comfort in knowing that there are other universes out there like ours. Because even if you didn't win the lottery in this universe, in another universe, 
Maybe, maybe you did. did. Maybe, maybe you're rich, and maybe, maybe they're better off than you are. And maybe you're actually better in this universe than in the other universes. Thank you. Thank you, Lavanya, for that talk. Our next speaker is Alyssa Ko, and she will be presenting Triple Dog Dares. Everyone, please give a warm welcome. When I was seven years old, one of the most terrifying things on the face of the planet was the triple dog dare. And I'm gonna tell you why. Because the triple dog dare was untouchable. What I mean by that is, in our neighborhood, it was the pinnacle of the entire neighborhood shenanigan hierarchy. And every single triple dog dare that you were assigned, you did, no matter what. And if you didn't, you were a failure. Triple dog dares are so incredibly important beyond just being a child. Because you know what? I'm not seven years old anymore. One thing about not being seven years old anymore is you automatically assume that you're going to lose that fearlessness that you once had. You're going to lose everything that made you feel weightless, like you could do anything. But that's incorrect, and I'm here to prove why. So, one of the very interesting things about not being seven is life moves on without you. As unfortunate as it is, you get busy. Lots of things start happening, and between all of the tests and the concerts and the projects, I'm sure many of you may or may not have been coming from tests actually today, you start to get really, really stressed out things start to not go your way. You're going to freak out. It's going to be terrifying. And sometimes it feels like the weight of the world is crushing you down. It's incredibly difficult to know how to move on. So you do what makes the most sense, which a lot of times is procrastinate. So you procrastinate, and you procrastinate a little more, and then you procrastinate a little more. And then you're sitting at your desk the night before your TEDx talk and you're thinking to yourself, how in the heck am I going to stand in front of a bunch of people and talk about something that I really should know? Well, I'm here to tell you that it's not so difficult and I don't have to feel bad for being a procrastinator because it's actually something that not only is very common, but makes sense because my brain wants to do what's best for me. Um, from a University of Colorado at Boulder study, here's this quote. Procrastination and impulsivity are linked primarily through genetic influences on the ability to use high priority goals to effectively regulate actions. That's a lot of long words, so I'm going to shorten it up a little bit. Basically, what that means is if you are a more impulsive sort of person, if you have a high discount rate, which means that you're more likely to choose options that will benefit you in the short term, as compared to in the long term, you're also more likely to be a procrastinator. Can I have a show of hands? How many of you drink soda? Cool. How many of you have drank in soda at least two times in the past week? Well, even though you maybe have New Year's resolutions and you might feel a little bit bad about drinking all that soda, that reason why people procrastinate is also really common for the reason why you're going to be drinking a lot of soda. Your brain makes decisions by judging specific actions' emotional significance. They're evaluated by a part in your brain, which is in the amygdala and the frontal lobe, and they organize by priority based off of what means the most to you at that moment. Your brain just wants to do what's best for you. However, it doesn't understand that's what's best for you in one moment, 
which might be watching a lot of cat videos or drinking a lot of soda, might be not so great for you in other moments, because sometimes the thing that you really need to do is study for that test or make that study guide. So how, for the procrastinator, the impulsive procrastinator who's going to be so likely to choose the very, very easy option, how do we get them to choose what's going to be most beneficial to them? I'm gonna provide a little scenario. Imagine your brain is an open casting call to the entire world. And everyone that comes in and auditions happens to be a decision. So every single decision that you could possibly make, they're all sitting at this casting call and they wanna be chosen to be the star. Your brain, as the casting director, obviously wants to make the best choice for the show. But your brain doesn't know what to choose because it thinks that everything is good because everything is good sometimes. For example, Miss Washing Dishes is going to be really, really productive and bring a lot to the group. But she might also be really dull and really boring. However, Mr. Binging America's Funniest Home Videos at three in the morning for seven hours, or whenever you wake up, is a really big drama queen and makes everyone's job so much more difficult in the long run. But he's got a little bit of star power and it makes it so much easier to see in the short term. So what does your brain choose? If you're a procrastinator, like I am, you're more likely to choose Mr. America's Funniest Home Videos because he seems like the best option for the job in the short term. However, as many of you guys who have put off studying for tests or put off basically anything know, that's not the decision that you wanna be making because it ends up in things that get really, really stressful. So how do we change your brain into doing what it should, which is choose the most reliable option? What we do is we add another option on the board, which is playing into the senses that you have as a procrastinator. One of the things that you do when you procrastinate and you procrastinate and you procrastinate is at some point you panic. And that panic button is basically what we need to set off a new reaction. The dopamine in your brain modifies neuron pathways in your brain in order to make specific decisions much easier to come to. So if you're more used to watching America's Funniest Home Videos, you're going to be more likely to choose that option again and again and again. Same thing with the soda example from earlier. However, what adding a timer does to Miss Washing Dishes is, imagine Miss Washing Dishes all of a sudden says, I'm going to wash dishes faster than anyone else ever. And you have to hire me to find out what I can do. That adds a sense of not only uncertainty, but adrenaline. There's a time limit. And that is very similar to the panic that you might feel that motivates you to finally do those 10 pages of American United States history homework. So adding that timer is incredibly, incredibly important for the procrastinator in you. However, maybe not all of you are procrastinators. And to that, I say, I wish I were you, but I am not. However, there are other types of people in this world who do very similar things to procrastinators and thus can really benefit from things that involve daring yourself to try and do things under a time limit or daring yourself to do something out of the box. For instance, perfectionists. There are a couple of different types of perfectionists that I'll address today. Um, one is the excellence-seeking perfectionist, which involves tendencies to fixate on making things as perfect as possible. However, the second one is the kicker. Failure-avoiding perfectionists have an obsessive concern with failing, so much to the point that they will avoid anything at all costs in order to not fail. That sounds a lot like our procrastinator because the more that you keep putting off decisions, the harder it gets. 
the perfectionist can also benefit from the, from the things that I mentioned earlier, which are incredibly important for making your brain make the decisions that you want them to. According to the World Health Organization, there are a record number of young people that are suffering from serious depression or anxiety disorders. The reason why I bring this up is because there are probably still some of you in the audience who don't identify with being a perfectionist or a procrastinator. However, this part is incredibly important because I think this is something that everyone can relate to. Unfortunately, the levels for anxiety and depression are rising significantly, and with them, perfectionism is rising significantly. So for those of you guys that don't have those issues, it makes you a lot more lucrative in a job market because you are motivated beyond just fear. So, for those of us who are perfectionists, who are procrastinators, how do we get on an even playing field? The answer is, with what I mentioned earlier, daring yourself to do things while under the guise of fear or time constraints. That's just an example, though. So, what I would really like to touch on today is the importance of making decisions, because I can't be seven anymore. And I really wish I could be. I really do, because being seven was one of the best times in my entire life. However, when I started growing up, I thought that because I wasn't seven anymore, I wasn't ever going to get that sense of fearlessness back, that sense of weightlessness back. I thought that growing up meant stressing out and doing things last minute and never knowing how to fix it. But I came up with a triple dog dare system for myself, similar to what I did when I was seven. By daring myself to do things, no matter what, no backsees, no taking back whatsoever, if I do it, I fail or I succeed. But the important part is that I was doing it. And that led me to one of the greatest discoveries of my entire life, which is why I really wanted to do this and share it with you. As a really big example, the whole reason why I'm here is off of a dare. I did this just because I thought, hey, why not? I should do this. And look where it's led me. Everyone can benefit from daring themselves to try something new, to do something different than what you normally would. And for the perfectionist in you, for the procrastinator in you, or for the person in you, that really just needs to learn that you don't have to be young to be free and to be fearless. That's an incredibly important lesson to learn. So to all of you in the audience, I'd like to propose a little bit of a test. Don't worry, you didn't have to be taking notes. However, I want all of you guys to be thinking in your head about a dare, something that you really, really want to do. It could be anything, something super hard, like I'm going to ask this girl out to prom, or something really minuscule, like getting up out of bed every day, even though sometimes that's the hardest thing to do. I want you to take that dare and take a dare every day from here on out and run with it. Whether you succeed, whether you fail, run with it. Go up to that doorbell, ding dong ditch it, push it, why not? And as you keep failing and as you keep trying, you're going to be able to make adjustments. And your brain, because of the neurons in it and the synapses in it, is going to adjust as a result. There's nothing left to lose. So when you have something that you want in mind, I think it's important that you go out and chase it. Because we're not seven anymore. We're growing up and we're gonna all be able to do great things. So, I triple dog dare you to keep pushing on. Thank you very much.
Since this event has been very successful and we anticipated that, we've already started drafting our license for the next TED event. If you'd like to be a part of this mission and this program, contact either Aiden or I and visit www.tedxghs.com for more information, pictures of this event, and videos. Thank you all so much for coming out. We look forward to seeing you at the next TED Talk. Thank you.